Kathy Busani. Thank you. Hello. Cheers. Thanks. Hi, thanks everybody for such a warm welcome, I really appreciate it. So this is just 20 minutes about our story, what we're about, how we've basically survived the recessions that we've been through. And really, it is about our people and our culture. It's about what we've created in the good times that's enabled us to survive in the not so good times. And I think that's what this is really about. You know, it's great when everything's doing really well, but how do you actually make sure you engage people when things aren't so well? And that's about engaging the heart. Yeah. So um, just to give a little flavour about us, first of all, before I talk about some of the things that we do, ultimately this is us. You'll see me there with an ice cream. And basically, if you come to our training company, then basically it's ice creams for everyone at three o'clock. That's how we get people sort of feeling refreshed, ready to do the afternoon. Unfortunately, I can't promise that here, but it certainly does work at our premises. We have won a lot of awards. We've won awards for things like Inspiring Workplace. Um, we've been in the top 20 UK best workplaces for about five, six years running. We've won things like Best of the Best for Customer Service, all those types of things. And that's really, in a way, sort of accolade to everything that we've created and a celebration of our people. So what I want to start by thinking about, just really following on from what Steve was saying, if it's this idea that top-down doesn't enable us at our best, then what is it that does? So what I'd like you to do is just have a chat with your neighbour about what are the sorts of things, thinking about over your own career, of where you've actually achieved your absolute best, you know, when you've been really proud of a moment in your career history. And what I'd like you to do is share that story with your neighbour, and in particular, think about what was it the manager did or didn't do that enabled you to achieve at your best? So just a couple of minutes just to share with the person that you're sitting next to. So what was it that your manager did or didn't do that enabled you? <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So thinking about thinking about the sort of things you were discussing, just want to get a sort of feel for some of the themes that may have come up as part of the discussion. For those of you when you were empowered to work at your best, when was it that your, for any of you, was it when your manager was closely monitoring what you did and told you exactly how to do it? Anyone have that? Nah. 
didn't think so. Okay, so for how many of you was it when you were trusted, believed in, given it freedom to do your way? Was that really what you were describing? Yeah? Okay. And for us, really, one of the key principles of happy is people work best when they feel good about themselves. So what we do is make sure that every one of our managers is tasked with that principle. So everything they do is about making somebody feel good. And exactly as Steve said, that doesn't mean doing it in a way that's rote, but it's about working out what the individual needs within a framework. So trust, freedom, being, feeling valued, feeling appreciated, feeling like you contribute something to the wider business. And I think I didn't quite get what um, um, my intro, but I think what one of the things that was said was one of the ways that we really enable people to work at their best is we ask them to choose who they want to be their manager. And that means if you're not a damn good manager, somebody's going to vote with their feet. Yeah? So that makes it really important. And what we end up with is people managers who see it not as an add-on to what they do, but as absolutely intrinsic to their whole job. And so often when people are in a management position, it's the bit they do when they haven't got time, you know, when they've got a little bit of time. We want it to be something that's a key focus for people. So what we have here is a, a lovely picture of two smiley people at Happy. We've got Ed um, in the pink. He's actually one of our deaf trainers. And he at Happy teaches people, hearing people, how to use IT and he has an interpreter in the room every now and again to help if needed but he actually lip reads and we're really proud of that and next to him is Nadia and they choose Nikki so basically at Happy recently their own managers left and they were asked who they wanted and Nikki was who they chose imagine in your workplace thinking about the managers that you have there who would be the managers that people would choose if they had a choice and who would everybody leave with a barge pole yeah I'm only MD at Happy, but we have our chief executive, and that isn't his core strength. So he's the great entrepreneur, he's the guy with all the ideas, he's the guy that helps make it happen for us. But ultimately, he isn't generally the pe person that people would choose to be managed by. Yeah? One of the other things that is um, very true for Happy is that we have collective decision making. You might see from the bright colours there that we're not a typical training company. This is really the cafe area where our delegates get to sit and enjoy and have those ice creams and everything else. And this is just a group of us having a discussion. And at Happy we do make collective decisions. So for example, if we're having tough times, then we have a regular staff meeting where the staff might say we need to think about the financials we need to actually take a vote on whether there's a pay freeze it's not management suggesting that it's actually the staff themselves and that makes a huge difference to the buy-in that we get so it's not us trying to persuade people of something it's actually our staff coming to us and saying this is what's needed and as part of that of course it's really important if you're going to have collective decision making then people need to understand your profit and loss. How many people here share exactly what's happening in the company on a regular basis financially? Hands up? Fab. Great to see it. Okay. So, but the, one of the keys about this is it's no good just sharing the information. You also need to help people understand it. So we use Lego to do that. Yeah? The Lego blocks, everyone knows about them, yeah? So we use those and we get people standing in a line and somebody represents turnover and then there's somebody who represents profit and there's somebody who represents overheads and we move the bits of Lego around and then we relate it to the spreadsheet. And we do that every now and again just to remind people how to understand the figures so that actually every quarter when we look at the bottom line, people are actually able to interrogate us and go, well, why is that overhead in there? Or what's that about? Or what on earth were we doing spending money there? And what that does is it enables people to take responsibility for what happens within the company and make decisions that are based around real informed choice. Yeah. Part of that also open information is 
You'll see some people whispering here. I don't know if your company's like this, but certainly other companies I've worked in, where you don't really know what so-and-so earns, but you can sort of make a guess. And what there is, is there's an awful lot of whispering. And what we've often found is that that whispering probably doesn't represent anything near what they earn, but you think you know. So what we've done is made salaries open. So we have a spreadsheet on the network, which basically has what the cleaner earns all the way up to what the chief executive earns. And what it also does is when we have pay performance rises, it has information on why somebody got that pay performance. So there's a bit of detail about it. So if you're thinking, I'd like to get a rise like that, you've got some indication of what you can do to get that. One of the other things we like to do is, you know, treat people as adults. So a lot of companies talk about, oh yeah, we really look after our people. What we do is we give them gym membership. Who here goes to the gym regularly? Yeah, about like I do. <laughs> so what we came up with instead, we wanted to concentrate on wellness, but what we came up with instead was this idea of you've got a budget, you spend it on what you like, and these are some of the things people have chosen. So we've had people pay to go on holiday. Does that help keep you well? I think it does. <laughs> it certainly does it for me. Massages. Sometimes people like to read books about things that either motivate them or inspire them or maybe help them get a healthier body. Vitamin tablets. We do have the gym membership there if it's what's for you. But also what we have is this idea that you might want cycling gear or trainers or things that actually help you. So we give people that choice over what they spend their budget on. And also, the other thing we do is we encourage people. So we don't want people coming in when they're sick, but if you do have a generally low sickness level, then we'll also give you your birthday off as an extra treat. You don't need to book it. You can just take it, do what you like. If it falls over a weekend, well, guess what? You get to choose whether it's a Monday or a Friday that you take. And that really helps inspire people. And we use something back in England called the Bradford Factor. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's a way of calculating sickness that looks at instances as well as number of days. And we found that to work really well for us. So, a couple of last things then. One of the things I just wanted to share as well that's part of our culture is this idea of celebrating mistakes. Who in your company celebrates mistakes? Anyone? <laughs> This one always gets people smiling. What's this about? Well, the idea of this is it's not necessarily that we throw a party every time something goes wrong. But what we do want is we want a lot of creativity and innovation. And if we want that, then we can't have that by keeping people safe, by getting people to only do what they always do day in, day out. Because quite frankly, that's the only way we never make mistakes. So if you want people to innovate, if you want people to do something different, then what you actually have to do is make sure that you have a safe environment where people can get it wrong and it will be something that people will laugh about, but equally something that people will learn from. And that's the key difference. We're not talking here about getting something wrong over and over. But at Happy, we say, if in your first three months you haven't made a mistake, then we failed you. Because I can't imagine anyone joining a new company and not getting it wrong. And one of my favorite ones was we had a trainer who wanted to join our technical team. And one of the first things she managed to do, Wei Hei, was delete all of our accounts from the network. The whole lot everything. But what was fab was because she wasn't afraid to say something, she very quickly came to us, said this is what's happened, and of course we just restored from backup. But of course if somebody's fearful of repercussions, what are they hiding in your business that's actually damaging it day in, day out? And we know companies that we work with where they have things like once a month, what's the best mistake? And then once a year, what's the best overall mistake? And they do things like you get a bottle of wine or a voucher or things like that. So there's lots of ways of saying within our business, it's okay to get it wrong. And we hope you will because it will help us as a business. One of the last things here that I want to look at is something around work-life balance and flexible working. Who here works flexibly? Hands? Most people? Okay. I just want to get a feel of what you think are the good reasons to be able to work flexibly. So I can get you all to stand up for a moment. 
And you can only sit down if you don't think this is a good reason to give someone flexible working. So do you think it's a good reason for childcare? If you agree with that, stay standing. Okay. Do you think a good reason to give somebody flexible working is to look after elderly relatives? Great. Anyone think it's a good enough reason if it's to do with education? So furthering yourself beyond whatever it is you're doing now. I'm very impressed with this audience. Normally at least half would sat down by this time. How about for cultural or religious reasons? Is that a good enough reason to give flexible working? Great. How about lifestyle? For example, somebody who actually likes to go clubbing on a Sunday night and isn't really fit for work on a Monday, so they take Mondays off. Ah, that always loses me some. Okay. Why do you think I use that example? Great for you who stayed standing. I'm really impressed. You can sit down now. One of the reasons I use that as an example is who are we to judge somebody's choices? And if we are going to engage people through their hearts, then we have to understand what it is that motivates them. And why should we penalise somebody who's made a different life choice than us? So we have given somebody Mondays off to work more effectively because, quite frankly, they weren't really fit otherwise on a Monday morning because their favourite club opened on a Sunday. And that's why our pictures of people dancing. Yeah? So maybe think about those things. Where are you stopping people that perhaps you don't need to? And I believe I should be a role model to that. So as MD at Happy, I personally take Mondays off. It isn't actually to go clubbing, but it is so that I can spend time with my family, which is really important to me. And it's what helps keep me passionate about what I do. To ensure that we keep our culture, to ensure that we make, you know, it's really important that things keep going, we have what we call our culture club. And they meet regularly to look at what are we getting right and what are we not getting right and what is it that we need to work on. So we make sure that the focus is kept there all the time. This isn't something you can do as a one-off. It needs to be intrinsic throughout every single thing that you do. And finally, really, the, the key point here is we also measure happiness on a regular basis. And we've done this for a number of years. And interestingly enough, one of the things we found is sometimes when our profits are at the lowest, our happiness is at the highest because people are really engaged and motivated to try and do better and do more. And we do this thing called a happy check. And all it does is it asks a range of questions which really we think get at the heart of what's important to us. So some of the questions are things like, how proud of you are working at our business? How happy are you to walk in during the day? How much do you understand those financial accounts? How well are we serving our clients? Yeah, those are the sorts of things that we ask about. And for us, the results are really important. And as part of collective decision making, we of course share those results um, with the people at the uh, team meetings that we have every fortnight. So, there's just some ideas there. I'd like you to just have a chat. Let's get you standing up. Find somebody you haven't yet spoken to. Have a think about what we've said. Is there anything there that you'd like to, you think could make a difference in your company? I'll just give you a minute or so to discuss that just before we close. So somebody you haven't yet chatted to, anything there that we've talked about that interests you or intrigues you or could make a difference in your company? I think Alex said he didn't want me to. Because Alex said... I don't mind, I'm, I can do, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to, yeah. I, I do normally, but... Yeah, that's fine. I didn't want to sort of I didn't want to spill it everywhere.
Okay, if you want to take a seat. If you want to take a seat now, thank you. So, anybody want to share with me any idea that they particularly loved and would love to give a go in their company? Anyone want to share? No? Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, just a sec, just a sec. Oh, okay. To celebrate the mistakes, yeah. I think it would be the most uh, important. Yeah, great, well done. Okay, anybody else? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I like the fact that you take happiness serious yeah. because that's one of the elements I've taken out of your speech is that sometimes you get the idea that being happy and having fun at work is related to not being professional or corporate or serious. Mm -hmm. So I like the fact that you've put it somewhat into system and still have uh, good yeah. business driving yeah. on it. Thank you. I think that's so important. I think happiness, people often think, is this some fluffy thing that you do as an add-on. And what we have done, and many other businesses in, London, in the UK have done, is prove that actually happiness at work doesn't only create great places to work, but what it also does is it improves your bottom line. And whereas we have competitors going under or being taken over, we aren't in that position. And that is absolutely everything to do with our culture. Yes. So any last questions just before? Before I finish, anything anyone wants to ask me? Also, like Steve, I'm going to be hanging around till lunchtime if you want to ask me anything separately anyway. But otherwise, thank you. Kathy Bosani. Ja, som, uh, just a minute. Uh, som Cathy sagde, så er både hun og Steven, når, når vi om lidt holder pause, så vil, uh, så vil de sidde herovre, og hvis I så har nogle særlige ting, godt vil spørge dem om, så er I altså mere end velkomne. Cathy, I just uh, repeated that you and Steven will sit yeah. up there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'd like to ask you a question. Please, yeah. Um, the board of directors, mm -hmm. are they as happy as you are? <laughs> Yeah, when we get, it's, it's interesting because we, we actually attracted an uh, external investor about four or five years ago and he said it's the only board that he really enjoys coming to and it's the only board where he really doesn't feel like he has to grill us and he just has a great time and he just loves it. So I think, yeah, we try to bring happiness into everything we do, but still, as, as this guy said, be professional about it and make sure people understand that it really does have an impact and make a difference. Are there any negative things to say about your way of developing and managing the company? Not in my experience. Um, for me, probably the key one, the top one of all of them, is about being able to choose your own boss. I don't know about anybody here, but certainly in my past career history, I've left my boss, not the company I worked for, because they have the opportunity to have the biggest influence on us. So if you get that right, everything else flows from it. But how, how do you think, what would the reaction I'm concentrating on the board of directors. Mm. How would the rea reaction be if, it, uh, if the bottom line went red instead of black? Which it has uh, done. And you still were happy. It still it has done in our past, and then that's about people then coming together. As I said, we have had in our past history people voting for a salary freeze, things like that. But ultimately, because everybody's so engaged, because everybody wants the company to succeed, and they understand the accounts, they take it very seriously. And we come together, and we don't lose the happiness. As I said, in fact, what a happy check shows is happiness goes up in times of difficulty. It doesn't actually. It's not not as high actually when things are easy and there's more money around. Something about our spirit, I think, in that. Well, one, one could imagine that, that, that some CEOs would say this is, uh, this is a lack of control yeah. uh, because uh, uh, happiness has nothing to do with work. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you tell a guy like that? I think it depends whether you want to employ a company of robots or a company of people who bring their mind and heart 
to work for them every single day. And that, for me, is the difference. I want people who are engaged and motivated with what we're doing, not just with their head, but with their heart too. But do they listen to you when, when, you, when you have a speech and, and tell these things that you just told us? Yeah. Uh, do they listen to you and do they act, react on it? In what way would they listen? Because it's part of everything we're doing. So I'm not quite sure on the question. Uh, well, do they change their, uh, the way of handling the employees? Oh, the companies we work yes. with. Yes, yes, absolutely. What we found is that we've worked with a number of companies really, really successfully. And um, there's one I can think of um, typically that I did a lot of work with over a number of years. And it was a te technical company mm -hmm. where they employed, um, basically, it's mainly 95% guys and they're software engineers, really high tech. And we took emotional intelligence into their workplace and we trained up, yeah, I know, honestly, what a feat and we <laughs> and we trained up their project managers and it was so amazing and we got them to think about what about if you worked from your strengths and the CEO had been talking about one of the project managers who is this fantastic software engineer but as a project manager he, those skills weren't being used but they didn't know how to say to him we don't really want you to do that anymore and after my training he was like you know what this isn't what I should be doing I should be going back to my roots and it was just so fantastic It, and they did it all for themselves and it's completely transformed the whole company. So it had a positive effect on the bottom line too? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Cathy. Cathy You're Bosani. very welcome. <laughs>